Hello and welcome to Life with God, a podcast where we explore key ideas in God through conversations with students and expert guests. In season four, we study the concept of beauty, and our guest in episode 10 is Santiago Fernandez, life coach and adjunct professor of religion at Union College in Lincoln, Nebraska. In this conversation, we're also joined by Samuel Eduardo Rica Pimana, William Delgado, and Melal Firisa. Before the discussion, we will take five minutes to learn a few things about our guest. What do you miss the most about your childhood? Ooh, the most. I think I miss my siblings, my older brother and my younger sister, because we had so much fun. But now that we're adults and we live in different places, I think we have not had those adventures together. But as I look back, the fondest memories are always with my siblings. My, they're, Yeah, they're the best. <laughs> what is your favorite book of the Bible? Favorite book of the Bible? Oh, there's many of them, but I would have to say Micah. How do you prepare for conversations like these? Great question. <laughs> I think uh, just with life experience, um, becoming aware of my own personal um, journey and walk, um, whether it be personal or my uh, devotional life with God. Do you have any hobbies? Sorry, do I have any what? Hobbies to do. You enjoy doing something. Uh, hobbies, I enjoy everything art, everything music, uh, recently I've gotten into reading. I'm reading a lot of different books. My wife says it's too many for me to be reading at a healthy <laughs> level, but yes, I enjoy reading now. Um, sports. If you could time travel, what would be your preference for time and location? Uh, present and now. Okay. <laughs> Spoken like a true chaplain. <laughs> Yes. Do you identify yourself with any biblical character? Yes, uh, several of them. I would have to say uh, Elijah, uh, specifically in the moment where he runs away from uh, Jezebel in the Bible. I think that I've been there. And at that moment, I think when he runs away, God provides for him, gives him two meals. And I love that about Elijah. And I felt like I've ran away from God several times and God has always provided for me. Pick one memory that defines who you are. Uh, it would have to be when I was, uh, it's one of my earliest memories. I was sitting on the front porch with my mom and she was drawing a picture and teaching me how to draw. And ever since then, I've just loved art. It's my strength. I love anything art, like I can draw, I can sculpt, I can carve. Um, yeah, and it's just one of my favorite memories with my mom. How many countries have you visited? Countries, uh, I would have to say, I can't, off the top of my head, somewhere between eight and 10. Um, I've been a lot in borders, so I don't know. Yeah, somewhere in that ambiguous number. What is the best thing about being a chaplain for you? The best thing about being a chaplain is meeting people uh, that are different from me, uh, seeing and hearing specifically their, their unique stories and how they attribute those stories, whether it is, is to God or, or something that's beyond themselves. I think as a chaplain, I've learned to listen to how God has worked uh, through somebody's life. Even if they don't recognize it, I, I hear it in their stories. And it's, it's really beautiful to have that privilege to sit with somebody and to hear their stories is something that I really enjoy about chaplaincy. What are some goals for your, for the future? Goals for the future. I think, um, number one goal is to be the best family, um, man that I can be. I just really love my family and raising my kids in, in the same rich environment that I was raised. It, it was deficient in some ways, but for the most part, 
uh, I feel like I received such a very rich uh, blessing of being raised um, to understand and to seek. I think that's my main goal is to continue seeking, to not grow stale in life. Uh, favorite character of the Bible in your childhood and now, and how has that changed? Favorite character in the Bible in my childhood would have been uh, Joseph. I think that was the very first biblical story I heard. I was 10 years old, and I had no idea of who God was. Um, and my uncle told me the story of Joseph, and I kind of started picturing the story. We were camping out in a tent, and I pictured the tents as big Egyptian pyramids. And that was my childhood character. I think if I were to look at it today, I would probably say, again, Elijah or Moses. Moses is another one that runs to the desert and God meets him and God appears in this like fire. Uh, and I think that God has always appeared in such a very awe inspiring way in my life. And I think that that's why Moses has become my favorite in my adulthood. Thank you. Thank you so much, Santiago. Uh, great having you back here. I'm really excited about this. Our focus today is on community. And I love how you just described here how God shows up to us in different places and in different ways. And I think community is one of the significant uh, places, for lack of a better word, where he shows up. Uh, our focus is on beauty. And so I'm intrigued to um, open the conversation with this question. How would you define, um, from a Christian biblical perspective, I should add, how would you define beauty within uh, community? Yes. Okay. So if you know me, you know, I like to start from the beginning of the conversation and the beginning is always Genesis. <laughs> okay. Right? I think last time I shared uh, Genesis verse one and two. So I'm going to share verse three this time. And God said, let there be light. And there was light and the light was good. And I think that that's where beauty happens for the first time um, because it was an exposure. So that Moses or creation could be seen. Um, God didn't need to be seen, but everyone else needed to see what he was working on. And I think that that inception of light um, is where beauty it happens. Um, the first thing that God says when he creates, he says it was good or tov in the Hebrew. And tov appears, I think, 270 something times in the Old Testament. And is often translated as beautiful as well. So if you think about it from this perspective, God created the light and called it beautiful. Love and it. It was, <laughs> yeah, it was the beginning of this like community that he was going to create. So he creates the light in order for the community to be seen. So the next day he creates and it says beautiful and beautiful and beautiful until the very end. He looks back and I think it's in Genesis 131 where he looks back and he says he created all these things and he called it very beautiful. It wasn't until the community was all present that it became very beautiful. And I think that that's where the conversation begins for beauty because everything that's subsequent to that, um, we have experienced and we have seen in the scriptural theme as it goes along. This is absolutely beautiful. Um, my favorite quote, you reminded me of my favorite quote ever, which is by Hans Georg Gadamer, who happens to also be one of my favorite thinkers. He's a German philosopher. And it, it reads like this. This is from Truth and Method. Light is not visible in any other way than by making something else visible. And it's, it's still a lot for me to ponder as I read it again and again, what, what light actually is uh, and its function to... Um, makes make other things that's its existence it's like its purpose is to make other things visible so that just reminded me uh, your, your your answer just reminded me of that um so let's go into more depth now on this connection between light how god created light in the beginning uh, as a way to um manifest to make visible the community that he was going to create right absolutely beautiful um how does how does um 
how is God's beauty reflected in that creative, created, I should say, created, creative community? Yeah, I, I think this is the part where light was the first indicator of time. So light indicated time. So it says there was evening and morning was the first day, right? Mm -hmm. Time can only be shared. So if I spend time or share time with you, I think we've gotten caught into the financial term of it where we spend time, but it, it can only actually be shared. So when I sit with somebody and have a conversation, that is the, the indicator that light created from the beginning is, is that God created this time so that you could share it. One with the person who's next to you, the other with the community, the other with the creation as a whole. So I think that light created this time and the time was given as the gift for us to be able to share it, to bless one another in that concept of, of time. Um, if you look at, at the texts of all of Genesis, it always says it was evening and morning. So the first thing that truly was created was time and God wanted us to spend time together to be with one another. And so when it gets to the end of the six days, he says it was very beautiful. But then Genesis 2 begins and there's no evening or morning there, but there is a Sabbath. So God calls the Sabbath holy. There's no evening or morning. So Sabbath is kind of a glimpse at the eternal community. It's, it's a glimpse at how God is eternal and how we can actually have eternity within a concept of time. So it is a glimpse of how we can share community with God and with each other and not be held down by time, if that makes sense. So can we say that Sabbath is an opportunity to enjoy the beautiness? Yes. Yeah. So, so Sabbath is the opportunity for us to see God's beauty um, because even he has rested and says, hey, let's spend time together. Let's be together in this. Um, you know, the whole scripture, there's all these biblical characters that are after God, chasing after God. But I think the number one example is David in Psalm 27 when he says, I ask one thing of the Lord that I may seek and to be in the presence of God to what? To behold his beauty. And I think that, that Sabbath is that moment where we could stop from everything else and experience that eternal beauty. Because again, it doesn't say, uh, I think it's Genesis verse two, three. It, does, it never says somewhere between verse one and three, it never says there was evening and morning because God wants us to not worry about time during um, the Sabbath when we can actually spend it with him and with each other. Um, I think of, of my own personal life when I'm in a rush or in a hurry, I tend to miss the beauty of God. But when I stop and when I meditate, when I pray, when I dwell on the word of God, then that's when I can experience beauty. I love that emphasis on the Sabbath, and I'm reminded now of a previous episode uh, from uh, season two about presence with Matilde Fry from Malawan University. She talked specifically about the Sabbath and God's presence within the Sabbath and how his creative work during the week is supposed to be a model for us. I'm going to make a connection with what we just said, Santiago, but his work in that creation week is supposed to be a model for us on how to live a good week. Of that if at the end of each day we can say this was a good day i've done something good today and then on sabbath we it's actually a celebration of a of a week well lived of a good week but now i'm intrigued a bit about a comment you made where you use the word beautiful instead of good and if i heard you correctly you're saying that we can use them interchangeably that the hebrew allows for a translation as beautiful is that is that correct yeah yeah so tav could be translated as as good but also beautiful or or fair or just those are different translations that have been used for for the word tov um, okay so then we could yeah we could say that um when we celebrate on the sabbath day we celebrate a, a week a beautiful week <laughs> if we were to follow god's model and and what is that 
um, maybe becoming a bit more concrete, I suppose, what does that look like? Because um, is it supposed to vary so much from person to person? Is there a standard that can help us focus in more or how, how do you see that? Yeah, I, I think I see the Sabbath as a culmination of us seeking God throughout the week. So throughout the week, I'm, I'm working, working, working to get to strive to get to where God is. But on the Sabbath, God says, I came to you. I'm here with you. And when we recognize that, that's when we recognize the beauty of it. And, and where is God? With his creation. And his creation is not an isolated thing. It, it is a harmony of things working together. So um, if the sun and the moon decided to stop working today, we wouldn't exist. Um, and I think if if we look at all creation as a whole, it is a harmony. It is a work of a community together. So when we stop on Sabbath, we look at his creation and we say, oh, wow. And when we recognize that we are in awe, that's when we have recognized the beauty of God in our lives, the beauty of God in that uh, glimpse of eternity, I think that I would call the Sabbath, because it is the one that we don't actually have to think about. Oh, I have 30 minutes till Sabbath is done and, and I'm good. Um, but rather saying, oh, Sabbath is almost over, but I can continue this on to my next week and my next week and and grow um, with God. You know, I, I always learned to look forward to Sabbath because it was a peaceful time um, when I first uh, became a Christian and an Adventist. It was looking forward to being in the presence of of peace. And I think that harmony and that peace comes from the very beauty that God created uh, at the inception of creation, which was, hey, let's all commune together and let's be together. And that's where God's beauty is found. You know, if you think about Revelation and in the future, the new Jerusalem, it says that God will be the light that will mm -hmm. shine for us. And, and being in his presence will be there, there will be no more indication of time, but there will be his presence, his light that is our substance that keeps us going. And, and it talks about an everlasting life based on just being in the beauty of God in the presence, that very beauty that David sought after. Well, one of the most beautiful moments of my week when I was a child was when we as a family received the Sabbath. Do you think that God also created this day to enjoy with the family? Well, this was a very special moment for us, and I think that for all of you. So I think that also God created the Sabbath to enjoy this as a family, as a community. How do you enjoy uh, with your family the Sabbath? Uh, with my, my personal family, um, I think... The, the way we do Sabbath is, is different in the sense that we, we check on each other every night. So we ask our little kids, my kids are six and seven, and we ask them every single night, like, what was, what was good about your day? Or what was beautiful about your day? And they tell us. But on Sabbath, we let them ask us what was beautiful. And it always reflects on them, like, you are the most beautiful part of our of our week you when you said this um last week my my son i asked him what do you want to be when you grow up and he said daddy i want to be a pastor and i said pastor and he said yeah i want to be like you and i was like but i'm not a pastor he's like yeah but you do pastoral things and <laughs> i want to be just like you and that was for me that was beautiful like that was timely like i was having a really difficult week and to hear my son say that it was like whoa okay it made me pause and I was no longer in the rush of things and, it, and I paused and then I recognized that there is beauty in in every aspect of life and in this case it was through my um, son who's seven years old so the other way that I, I've done it outside of my family um I, I worked as a uh, drug and substance abuse counselor at one point. And I, I think this is, Milal, you asked me a question about what are memories that define me uh, as, as an adult. Um, I was younger and I had just started working at this place. 
and I had a person that was dropped off by the police and the police officer said to me, um, here's this person, uh, don't call us because we're full in the <laughs> behavioral health facility, we're full. He's probably gonna harm you or he's probably gonna harm somebody else. And so we looked at the person and he was what I defined at that time, ugly. And, and I know that that was a terrible, and I even had morals back then, but this person was ugly but by just looking at them. And so I looked at, at this man and I said, uh, there's no way I'm gonna be able to help this person. He, he's ugly all around because he walks into my office and he says, by the end of the night, you're gonna call the police again. And I said, they told me I can't call them. <laughs> And he said, no, by the end of the night, you will call the police. And so I did because he put a bunch of rocks in a pillow and he said, I'm going to hurt somebody or I'm going to hurt myself. So I called the police and I, I started praying about this. I said, God, this person is just a terrible person. And then one night I got to see him and I don't know what was in my heart, but I hang guitars on my walls like this in my office. And he grabbed the guitar and I said, just get out of my office. Like you can take the guitar with you. And as he's walking out, he starts playing and he starts playing this beautiful melody. And I pause and I said, take a seat in my office. And he starts playing this beautiful melody. And I realized that I had just pictured this person as, as an ugly person. And then when he played the guitar, I ended up spending, I think 10 hours with that person. And at the end of it, he's one of the most beautiful people I've met to date. And I just listened to his story. I listened to what he was sharing with me. I listened to how God had been present in his life. He wrote this song in front of me. It was called Divine Intervention. And he was writing based on our interaction. And how he felt it was beautiful to have somebody give him the time of day. He said, it's been so long since somebody sat down and made me feel human again that I had forgotten. Thank you for making me feel human. And that really defined how I approached spending time with my family, how I approached spending time with my friends, how I approached spending time with the community, which was make people feel human. And remember, when God created humans, he called them Tov, beautiful. Oh, that's, that's great. So um, we can actually say that the beauty of God can be transmitted or shared with others, um, even through our testimony or through our acts that we, uh, how we deal with people and we talk, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think beauty is manifested when we recognize that God has created the person sitting in front of you that God has walked with the person standing in front of you or having a dialogue with you. Um, I mean, I don't always see eye to eye with people, but when I pause and I say, hey, this person is created by God, this person God loves just as much, this person um, is somebody whom Christ hung on the cross for, then when I pause and I say, okay, then my mind changes about, and, and I see even beyond the darkness, I see even beyond the uncertainty of knowing who the person is, I see the beauty that God has placed in that. I really like the experience that you shared and um, that actually anticipates anticipates a question that I, I was formulating in my head because you painted this beautiful picture in Genesis, right? Uh, but that's really not our experience today so much. So just getting a bit real here, um, you use a phrase that I, I think you use it this way, remind me if not, time is a gift for community or something of that nature, you connected time with community. Uh, I think we could also say time is a gift of community because time as change and sequence is um, in a sense community. It's without time, we wouldn't have community basically. But um, what are some, how did that get corrupted and how, how can we remedy that maybe? It's a big question, but if you can touch on some things that allow us to be um, a bit practical about this beautiful picture that you've created. 
Yeah. How did it get corrupted? It's mm -hmm. not in Genesis 3, I mean the fall, but um, Genesis 3, the first three verses, you can see that um, Eve sees the serpent and the serpent is cunning. Um, the Hebrew word there is arum. Um, it's used in the very previous verse. So Genesis 2, the last verse of Genesis 2, I don't remember what it is. I think it's 25 or, uh, yeah, I think it's 25, but it says, and the man and woman were arum and not ashamed, um, which is naked. So in a way, in a sense, the Hebrew is, is playing with these two words and it's saying, um, Adam and Eve were naked and were unashamed. And then she sees the serpent, which is Arum, mm -hmm. um, often translated as cunning or crafty, but it has to do with the aesthetics of the senses. Number one, the vision. Um, I think corruption has come when we look at something and we define it based on what we see rather than what we know. So for example, I saw that that person that had come into my office and I saw them and they were ugly. But when I got to know them, I saw the, the, the beauty or I heard the beauty. And I think that that's where the corruption has begun is that we, we are constantly assuming that beauty is only found in the sight or beauty is only found in the things that please us. Um, but in, in the context of everything, beauty is not just limited to the visual. So if I were to ask you, about what you find most beautiful in your life it's not going to be directly in front of you what you're looking at you're going to you're going to remember you're going to look back and it has nothing to do with your eyes it's a collective of all your senses like touch feel taste smell oftentimes i'm walking down it happened to me yesterday and i smelled something that took me back to my childhood and i was like that is beautiful so i think the corruption happened when we limited to only just our sense of sight or just to one sense rather than as a whole, a, a knowledge of, okay, that God said that it was beautiful, but why was it beautiful? Because um, we could share it together. And again, man and woman were standing in front of each other and they saw each other naked, but they were unashamed. So their eyes were pure at that time. The moment that their eyes became impure, they saw their nakedness, and then they became ashamed. How do you help others see the beauty in their life? Good question, Milal. I think um, being able to be present in the moment, and, and, and I've shared this before, but being in the moment and seeing what is God doing in my life right now? What is God doing in the life of the person or thing in front of me? How, how has God played a role in this? Um, it's spring, uh, you know, when the spring flowers come up or even in the winter snow, when the snow falls, um, there are things that it's like, that is perfect design. Like God designed all these things and, and stopping for a moment and saying, oh, wow, this is incredible. Um, I've worked with, with students and, and people that have suffered from panic attacks. And, and while they're actually suffering through it, one of the things that really helps them during these attacks um, is to pause and to look at something. So a lot of the times I'll, I'll have them look at their thumbprints and just follow the grooves in the thumbprints and I say, you are design of God, like God intelligently designed you so unique, so unique that you're the only one that has that. Look into, look into my eyes and I'm looking into your eyes. And that's beautiful because you are uniquely made. No two people have the same eyes. Um, and if you think about it from that perspective, you know, um, when people have worn masks through COVID, you could only see their eyes, you could only view their eyes. But that was still beautiful because you were looking into the eyes of somebody that God created and somebody that God cares for and that is striving to bring back to his community. That's beautiful. I really appreciate the question. 
uh, the direction in the atmosphere. And I'd like to connect that now with what you said just before about shame, because I've been I've been pondering that shame is such a powerful uh, thing and, and concept. And the way I understand it currently, I could be wrong. I'm, I'm not a professional, but the way I understand it is that it is not a feeling, but it's a core or emotion, but it's a core belief about yourself that is then translated into a variety of feelings and emotions, depending on context. And so I see shame actually as a human condition. Um, I could almost define sin as um, being manifested in shame. And um, that's just our identity was shattered at that event in Genesis. Our identity as a human race was shattered and it was veiled in shame. And shame oftentimes also has more to do not to not to uh, excuse Adam and Eve here, but it also has a lot to do with what is the, is done to you, and not so much guilt versus shame. Right? Guilt is what I do, and I'm responsible for shame. What others do to me that I then carry into my being that becomes part of my identity, and I have to deal with it. Oftentimes, it's a life lifelong process to heal from that. Right? And so, I think that is a basic human condition of 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 our race, of our human race, from Genesis, from the fall event. And um, I can see how that corrupts everything. My question would be, um, again, trying to connect our corrupted state of shame of what was done to Adam and Eve, how they were deceived into sin. Um, and how does that, um, I guess, how do you recover from that? How, do, how does that affect community? I guess would be my first question. How does that concept of shame affect community currently for us? And how do we recover from that? Big questions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think shame is a mirror reflection of ourselves because when I identify the shame in somebody else, I'm actually identifying my own shame. Mm -hmm. uh, when I look at someone, I see what is going on within me because I can't, I can't read someone else's mind. I can't, I can't process their emotions. I can only process my own emotions. And so when I look at somebody and I see shame, I'm seeing it in myself. Um, I, I think that as far as like what I've been sharing with beauty and time, God has this master plan of like, there's the time for this, there's a time for that. And like Jesus comes at the specific time. If you think about it, I've shared with you, you know, the, the serpent, Adam and Eve. So the serpent is hanging off of this tree in the midst of a living garden, hanging on this tree that and offering death. Now, fast forward to the perfect time when Jesus comes, he's hanging on a tree of death, offering life. Um, one is in a garden of, of life. And the other one is in the valley of death. It's even called that Golgotha, um, the, the skull or the, the hill of the skull, whatever you want to call it. Um, but it is the, in the presence of death. Jesus not only redeems uh, Adam and Eve and every sub subsequent thing that ha happened after that, but he's hanging there in shame and nakedness. Um, so he not only re redeems Adam and Eve, but he also, if you read John. 314 and it's right before the um 316 that we know so well john 314 says just as the serpent was raised by moses so must the son of man be lifted up because whoever believes in him shall be saved and so when jesus is hanging in shame he actually redeems the serpent the animal because he's the one hanging on the cross um, all, all of the curses that were given, so it was given to Adam and Eve and then even the serpent, Jesus at the right time redeems all three of them. I don't know if you've ever thought about that, but in that moment in time, God chose to redeem humanity, um, the serpent, and even the law, um, the, the perfect law that had been tarnished or, or stained or whatever you want to call it by satan satan was saying uh your law is ugly god because it's not it's perfect and nobody can keep it and at the moment jesus dies um jesus exposes the veil right where the laws were kept and now he says it's no longer in a in one place but it is written on the tablets of the heart of the human heart and i think that 
everything happens in the context of how God has come at the right time in every of, of stages of life um, as far as history goes. Now, for each individual person, we all have our battles, we all have our, our struggles, our issues. And I think that recognizing and seeing that Jesus himself was in the shame and looking toward Jesus and, and the Bible, of course, being the, the number one um, account that shows us what Jesus did for us. When we look at those scriptures that I've shared with you, and now we can think of, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And I think that that's the most beautiful message that we can receive is that even though we have we experience shame or we have been through shame, Jesus can understand us. He can sympathize with us in the shame that we've experienced. When God called Abraham, he didn't just call him, he also called his wife, this little community, because God also changed, it, changed the name of, of, of his wife. Um, then God, from this Abraham and Sarah, he created a great community, a great nation, that's right? And to share with them his love, his law, his beautiness. My question is, how important is community to experience uh, beautiness? Could we experience beautiness without a community being alone? Given the experience that Abraham had, I, I don't think that we can experience the, the beauty in community. And, and the reason being is, uh, like I said, from the beginning, there was this sense of community and, and it all is put into this it's kind of like an inclusive um, creation so one has to function with the other um, it's it's a collaborative effort um, and even god gets in on it with the sabbath where he comes and we all join together all of creation comes together i think that it has to do with that now um, as far as like abraham's own personal story i love that uh, god tells him i will provide um, and we were talking about, uh, I think, vision being when the corruption happens with beauty. So God, when he says uh, it's Adonai Yireh is the, the Hebrew. Now, the word Yireh means to see. So God will see what you cannot see. So when we look at God, we actually see what God is seeing. Um, so in Abraham, with Abraham's personal story, he said, you may not be able to see but if you trust me, you will see. <laughs> Does that make sense? There, there's kind of like a, a dichotomy there. So with our human capacity, we are only limited in what we can see. But when we look at God, we can actually see beyond our limitations. Um, and I think when we look beyond the limitations, um, we begin to see that that God is not exclusively for me. Like God is, I'm not the center of the universe. Like God is not just focused on me, but God is focused on we, on us uh, together um, in the same way that God was focused on the family of Abraham, not just Abraham specifically. Um, thank, thanks for the, for the answer. That was yeah, a really good insight in the history of Abraham. And I was thinking out about uh, how do we experience uh, the beauty of God uh, as a community. And you know, when we uh, study the, um, the history of David and Solomon and the plans that they had for um, a, uh, an experience of worship, a worship experience that, that was beautiful and that reflect, reflect um, the beauty of God and through images that represent him or send the, the, the environment in which he was. Um, do you think that we, uh, can do that uh, in our times? Can we use this kind of aspects or, or maybe tales in the worship? Because in, in our, I think last week, uh, there are many elements that have been uh, inducted in the church uh, where we can uh, take them and, and they help us to, to experience God, like uh, worship and music through music or maybe the, the visuals or even lights, some churches uses lights. How can we, uh, take a good or positive um, 
how, how can we help us in, in the in the worship of God through these little elements and then and worshiping like a community? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I believe that there is a um, personal element to worship, um, but it culminates within the community. So the fullness of worship happens in the community. Um, God gave uh, the Israelites the, the sanctuary and it, and it had a community of people around the sanctuary. Um, and I think that when we celebrate the individuality of others other than ourself, when we celebrate what God is doing in someone else's life, then we come very conscious of what God is doing in, in my life as well. Because it, it's beautiful to say, oh, God is working in such a different way for this person. And now I've become aware of something different than I didn't know because I was only limited to what I know. Um, and the same for the other person. When they hear experiences um, with me and God, they could see a different side of God or a different aspect of God that um, was only limited if it was just um, refrained to the personal um, worship experience. When we worship as a community, when we sing together, we're all singing a song of uh, redemption of how God, we're celebrating God. Um, we're all, when we read together, we're, we're reading the story of how God is redeeming us individually um, and community wide. It's beautiful. Um, I really like how you created that parallel between the serpent and Jesus. That's just powerful. It's beautiful. I heard it before, but you added some really important nuances to it that I think um, make it more, um, more evident, so to speak, that you cannot, you cannot, once you see it, like the way you helped us see it, you cannot uh, not see it. But um, so then can we say that Jesus, we often use the expression, Jesus took our sin away, right? But the way to describe it, we could say very well that Jesus took our shame because he, 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 and our shame and our nakedness. And maybe that is what defines sin, really. And that is really our identity. So he took our, our identity of shame and nakedness of people being deceived and robbed of our, of our original state, of our ideal desire for us. And so that we could have um, back that ideal life, so to speak. Um, and then you connect that with, um, yeah, how we can maybe use that picture to function better in a community. My question is about boundaries. Um, we talked a lot about community as coming together and there is a sense of, oh, it's beautiful. They were meant for it, were created for it. But then how do we navigate that community uh, with good boundaries? What are some tools or insights you would offer there um, to help enhance and not detract from it? construct and not destruct more what is already corrupted yeah i think uh if, if we look back at the at the story of jesus he he did create boundaries mm -hmm. um he did say this is how far uh beauty goes um from from the cross what i can think of is in his last breaths he defines beauty in, in, in such a way that I think is, is creating those boundaries. But he, he yells, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You, you know this, right? And so when he yells that he's actually making an appeal and creating boundaries for the Pharisees, because the Pharisees were very well acquainted with the scriptures. They had it memorized. And Jesus was reciting Psalm 22. If you read Psalm 22, you can see that everything that is happening when Jesus is dying is happening in Psalm 22. So number one, he's making an appeal to the Pharisees because um, he knows that they know that passage. And if they see that it was prophetically given to their king, David, then maybe they might turn. Now, in the, in the appeal, he's also creating boundaries. He's saying, this is as far as I'll go. This is the place where it comes to an end. Now, you make a decision now, or you will never make a decision. Um, and the boundary that is created is, is when we look upon the cross, when we look upon the narrative of 
scripture as a whole, when we look upon the, the thematic redemption of, of Christ in the scriptures, and we don't see our personal identity, we don't see our true identity, that's when God says there's that boundary. So I think when we tell somebody you have no identity or your identity is within the confines of what I define your identity being, I think that is what creates the issue of um, the same issue that was from the fall where Satan was saying, this is your identity. You could be like gods, but you're not. So he was diminishing them. He was telling Adam and Eve, you're less than gods. So he was giving them a currency. But Jesus, when he's on the cross and he's telling the Pharisees, he's like, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You have currency. Look, God wrote this from the beginning. Like, you have value to God. Stop this nonsense and turn and see what God has for you. You're better than this. You're better than mocking somebody who's hanging on a cross. You're better. Your law is better than spitting at somebody. Your law is better than beating somebody to the point of unrecognizable physical attributes. So when he's making this appeal to the Pharisees, he's actually giving them his final sermon in his dying breaths. That's just the beauty of Jesus is that he chooses his dying breaths to still make an appeal to those who hated him. When Jesus died, well, Isaiah uh, 53 described Jesus like he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, right? Um, how can we relate the concept of sin and ugliness? Because he, the, Jesus take the, the sin uh, and he's described like without beauty and without majesty to attract us. So how, how can we relate this to comes of sin and ugliness? Yeah, I think it was Galatians 3 where Paul says, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Um, so this goes back to the, the point of seeing limitedly. As humans, we only have a limit to see. So when Jesus is making this appeal, he's saying, look beyond across look beyond what you're seeing and align yourself to the identity to the value that god gave you from creation from the beginning because when you align yourself to that identity you see beyond the limits of of what sin has allowed you to see um so when the serpent gave the fruit to adam and eve he said you will become like gods um lying to them and limiting their view to that so you can only become this this much but i think the uh, initial um intention of god was you are rulers um over the the earth you have dominion over the the earth and the animals and so it was kind of this ambiguous where god was saying look you can you have control you have power and when the serpent comes in, the, the serpent just says, you're limited to this. You can only be this much and you cap off of that. So when Jesus is inviting us to see him, we see the, the beauty beyond the cross. We see the beauty beyond the limited. We see, again, we see beyond time. We were limited to time, but we see, we get a glimpse of the eternal beauty of God that will one day be what gives us light of life, what gives us uh, everlasting life. I think this conversation is really helping me put a different spin on the concept of shame from a more biblical perspective. And I really appreciate that. Um, I'm thinking now, maybe connecting a little bit psychology, a chaplaincy experience here, where uh, trauma early on um, in childhood can uh, instill that feeling, that belief of shame, uh, that's shame, I guess, you know, that, that belief about yourself, that you are insignificant, that you are, um, yeah, not important, worthy of being neglected, abused, and so on and so forth, whatever it is that creates shame in us and then later in life 
I, I used to think at least I'm changing my mind now, but later in life, um, uh, our experiences and our encounters with each other trigger those early childhood events. And so they trigger shame. And then it's just really complicates relationships of any kind. But now that we've talked about shame in the Bible as a human condition, that I wonder if even the early childhood events really trigger something deeper in us that is already there, that is, that is just genetic um, part of our human condition. And so our healing maybe needs to go much beyond um, a therapy, of course, is important. Dealing with uh, trauma is important. But there is this spiritual aspect, this um, long-term condition that we have as a race that you've highlighted very, very meaningfully, I think, for us. Um, any thoughts there along these lines that you could, you could, you know, how do we make, how do you make use of, of resources in the community, in our scientific community, in our social sciences, psychology and so on and so forth that help us heal from that perspective, but also connect that with the spiritual dimension. Yeah, I think the healing comes when we find our, our value, our currency that, that God has intended for us. Mm. Um, and, and when we find our true identity, I mean, if you, if you think about a healthy family, a healthy community, um, it celebrates the uniqueness of the person. So when a child is born, when a baby is born, um, for the most part, if it's a healthy family, you look at it and you say, oh, what a beautiful baby. And you do everything you can to take care of that child, to take care of the baby. And I think that if we approach life in the same way that you're a member of our community, you know, um, I'm thinking specifically about our church, people walk into to church or people walk into our community events and things like that, because they are hurting because they are in that experiencing that trauma, because trauma is something that happened in the past, but you're presently still uh, living in, in the present. Um, it, it is activated in the present, but it's an event that occurred in the past. And I think that if we acknowledge, okay, this is what happened in the past. Um, and this is what therapy does. If you go to see a psychologist, you'll, you'll understand that this event happened in the past, but your response can be different. Your response can be uh, based on your true identity, not what the event told you your identity was, but what your, your, your true currency that you are, um, you are a valued, uh, child of God, you are a person that is unique and that will make unique contributions to this world. Um, and, and recognizing that and putting somebody in the present and saying, those things, those events that happened in the past are just events, your response can change. Um, I think of Acts 3, uh, when Peter and John were going up to the temple and there's this lame man and he's laid at the temple gate called beautiful every day. And later on in Acts 4, I think it tells us that he had been there for 40 years laid. Ugly situation. Um, if you think about a lame person, they can't get up and walk to go to the bathroom. They can't eat on their own. This person was relying on the community. And what did the community do is they drag him, throw him at the temple gate and walk away. So his currency, his identity was, I'm worthless. People walk by, they throw money. And I did this math one time, and he would have been a millionaire after 40 years. If, if he was just getting somewhere between 5 to $10 a day, he would have been a millionaire. But the money would have never given him his true currency. The moment he gets his true currency is when Jesus, or when Peter says, look at me look at me. And then he extends his hand and lifts him up because Peter himself had a currency in his own life. And Jesus looked at him too. And Jesus said, come on up. And now he's doing the same for that person. And what does he say to the lame man? He says, in the name of Jesus, I tell you to stand up and walk. And for the first time in the 40 years that we know of, somebody says, look at me in my eyes, look at me. And that moment is when he recognizes and he sees a reflection of his beauty when he looks at Peter, because Peter had seen his reflection of his beauty when he looked at Jesus. And Peter's just a disciple. He learned from Jesus. 
And that's the thing that we ourselves can learn the same because at one point in our lives, I believe that Jesus has looked at us. And I think that we can see the beauty in someone else in the same way and just project that beauty that God has given us, that currency, that inherent, beautiful, um, unique relationship that we have with God. Santiago, it is an absolute joy having you in this program. Uh, I really like your perspective. You bring unique things to the discussion uh, from your um, experience, from your education. You bring unique vocabulary, I think, that also enriches our, our understanding from the scripture about God, about ourselves, about human nature and in, in, in your connection and relationships um, with, I think, practical applications. Now, this is, we talk about ideas. Ideas are complex. The Greeks knew that. <laughs> they misinformed us um, about what ideas are in the sense of where their origin is. And we're trying to correct that in the program. But they were at least right in this aspect that they are complex. And so we're wrestling with some difficult, almost intangible things, right? Beauty. Um, but I think the conversation takes us much beyond what we usually hear or read about beauty in, in our society, right? Which tends to be very superficial, um, surface, yeah, very, um, very much based, I would say, also on the visual aspect, which you just beautifully illustrated how um, not contradicting something, but just re reducing the human being to one senses, as opposed to its holistic um, nature, that alone can be extremely detrimental. And that's, I think that's kind of what has been our experience since the fall, that limitation. And you're inviting us into more holistic thinking that can really change uh, our, our thinking and then our interactions, because that's where the rubber really meets the road. So Thank you so much for this conversation. I think we take away a lot from it. Um, we're going to move now into this segment and share some, some takeaways, but I just wanted to say how rich this was for me personally in terms of changing perspective. And I'm excited about it, really. Am. So uh, what are some takeaways for you personally from this discussion? I think seeing that I'm looking at a screen of, of people that are from various different places and just, uh, I mean, we've taken the time to get to know each other and, and we've talked even before this recording, but I think that we're all from different unique backgrounds perspective and that God has still spoken to our lives. Um, when, I, when I think about your questions, your questions uh, are how God is walking with you and your experiences. And they all align with the, the scriptural message um, because we, we are seeking um, to get a richer and deeper relationship with God. And I think the concept of beauty is seeking after a deeper and a relationship, not just the superficial, but beauty is going beyond the just the senses and going into what the scripture is showing us. Well, I also love to understand how uh, God created this world for a, co a community. And God shared uh, with us uh, his beautiness, and we can receive that as a community. And that's what I'm taking with me from this conversation. Well, for me, um, it was really uh, calling. And I think what I, what I take away at this is that I need to be more uh, Pay more attention to my, to, to my family and to the, to the other people that surround me, uh, because maybe in, in maybe we are so egocentric sometimes and we only focus on ourselves. But there is a lot of beauty in other people, and, and we can also share with them as a community. And that's what I kind of take away this of this really good conversation. Oh, uh, what I took from this conversation is that um, like um, God can use us like Peter used um um like peter used um him to show others that like everyone has beauty in them and that like even like in our lives we can we can see the beauty and like use it and then help others also see their their beauty love it um well i already shared a lot so i think i'm gonna summarize just one one takeaway although i'm taking a lot more than this but um uh just the idea that holistic we are holistic beings and that we need to learn how to define beauty from that holistic perspective i think that is really 
can be potentially quite life changing individually and as a as a community as well. Um, so yeah, thank you again so much, Santiago, for everything you shared and for also listening and responding to our concerns and questions. And uh, what would be your final words for our listeners and for our viewers about the topic of goddess beauty in the community? Beauty is a glimpse at the mysterious aspect of God, I believe. I think that there's a lot that we don't know about God, but that's the beauty of it, is that we can keep looking after, searching after God. And, and I think that it's it's culminated or, or best um, shared in Psalm 27. If you get a chance, read that. And it's this desire of, of David to seek after God and to go after him to do one thing. And that one thing is to look or to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. I think understanding that is where we will find um, our true value, our true currency, uh, where we will be able to celebrate um, the uniqueness of each person that is found in, in God's community. Um, God is inviting us to share in this experience as he, he's done it through the Sabbath, he's done it through um, his redemptive plan, and he wants us to, to come into this invitation. He wants us to be able to celebrate um, this beautiness and, and to be able to share it together. And I think that that's the number one thing uh, that I get from reading the scripture is that God is freely giving this beauty. And, and it's, it's so substantial as compared to the beauty that we see in, in our world or the beauty that we understand in this world is so limited, but the one that God is offering is so much more meaningful, so much more, um, it offers so much more purpose for our lives. And I, I just really, I really resonate with seeing God in, in a beautiful sense. And specifically from the beginning, like I said, God at the very beginning, he created everything and called it very beautiful. A heartfelt thank you to our special guests and to the student panelists for their thoughtful engagement. On behalf of our sponsor, the Adventist Theological Society, and on behalf of the Life with God team, I would like to also thank our viewers and our listeners for being here. We hope that you have learned some new and helpful insights that will transform you more into the likeness of God and empower you to become a better human being. As you can see, these conversations bring together young adults and scholars who have dedicated their lives to advancing our understanding of God, of the Bible, and of the complex human personhood. It is a unique opportunity for you to get to know these committed servant leaders and learn from them as they interact with students from around the world. If you would like to support this podcast, you can do so with your presence, your comments, your prayers, and by sharing the program. If you're so inclined, you can also extend your financial support by donating to the Adventist Theological Society. To do so, go to www.atsjats.org slash resources and find the Donate Now button. Make sure you also subscribe to the Adventist Theological Society YouTube channel where you will find past and ongoing seasons. Thank you again, and I hope that you will join us next time as well.